everyone my name is gajendra deshpande today i will be presenting a talk on build your first cyber forensic application using python in today's talk we will be briefly discussing about the following topics that is introduction to digital crimes digital forensics and the process of investigation and the collection of evidence then setting up python for forensics application development then built in functions and modules for forensic tasks forensic indexing and searching hash functions for forensics then forensic evidence extraction metadata of forensics then using nlp tools for forensics let us first look at the cyber crime statistics the internet crime report for 2019 released by usa's internet crime complaint center ic3 of a federal bureau of investigation has revealed top four countries that are victims of internet internet crimes so you can see here that usa uh, has reported more than 4 lakh crimes uk more than 90000 canada more than 33000 and india more than 27000 of course these are all only reported numbers but unreported numbers can be much much higher so according to rsa report mobile transactions are rapidly growing and cyber criminals are migrating to less protected soft channels that is because not many people are aware of the uh, security settings of the mobile phones according to report by norton an estimated 113 million indians lost about 16000 rupees on an average to cyber crime that is roughly around 200 dollars according to an article published in indian express on 19th uh, november 2016 over 55% millennials in india are hit by the uh, cyber crime then similarly a recent study by checkpoint research has recorded over 150000 cyber attacks every week during the covid-19 pandemic there has been an increase of 30% in cyber attacks compared to previous weeks now let us first look at the definition of forensic science so forensic science is the use of scientific methods or expertise to investigate crimes or examine evidence that might be presented in the court of law then cyber forensics is investigation of various crimes happening in the cyber space so examples of cyber attacks include phishing ransomware fake news fake medicine extortion and insider frauds then according to dfrws that is digital forensic research workshop it can be defined as the use of scientifically derived and proven method toward the preservation collection validation identification analysis interpretation documentation and presentation of digital evidence derived from digital sources for the purpose of facilitating or furthering the reconstruction of events found to be criminal or helping to anticipate unauthorized actions shown to be disruptive to the planned operations now if you look at the definition there are two parts first uh, speaks about the different steps which needs to be followed in gathering the evidence and then the second one speaks about the reconstruction of events and uh, producing the evidence in the court of law now there are six steps in digital forensic investigation uh, process so first one is identification then collection then validation examination preservation and finally the presentation so in identification step what happens is the uh, investigation investigation officer uh, visits visits the crime location and tries to identify the different objects which can be the source of evidence so these can be the um, physical as well as uh, uh, software so if the system is on then he has to perform a live forensic sometimes or the important step here is in collecting the evidence is to maintaining the uh, state of the system so if you change the state state of the system that is from on to off or off to on then there is a possibility that Uh, the evidence may get lost especially the data stored in volatile memory will be lost then while collecting the evidence uh, the investigative officer need to identify the different objects sometimes uh, there may be uh, toy devices so even uh, 
investigation officer need to identify such doors, such toy devices, such as toy pen drives, and collect them. The next is the validation. So generally, what happens is, uh, investigative officers they take the snapshot of the entire system using the system image um, software such as uh, uh, Norton Ghost. So they will be performing examination on the copy of the data, not on the original data. That is because if they perform operation or analysis on the or the examination of evidence on the original copy, then there's a possibility that it may get uh, modified. So in that case, it will not be accepted as an evidence in the court of law. So once the examination is performed on the copy of the data, the copied image need to be compared with the original image. So here basically hash algorithms are used. So they are used to check whether the integrity of the information is maintained or no. The so next is the preservation. So preservation of evidence is very, very important. So when uh, the investigation an officer is collecting the evidence, he or she will be uh, collecting those evidence such as pen drives, uh, cables, right, mobile phones, smartphones, etc. So they need to be kept in a special anti-static bags or also known as Faraday bags. Okay. Then they need to be stored in a secured uh, and safe location in a locker with appropriate temperature. Otherwise, it may also affect the evidence. It may corrupt the evidence or it may modify the evidence. Then finally, the collected evidence needs to be presented in the court of law. If all these steps are followed correctly, if all the steps are followed as per the uh, rules uh, specified by the law enforcement agencies, then only it will be accepted by the uh, court of law. So that's why uh, care should be taken by investigation officer to uh, follow the steps and the uh, procedures uh, laid out by the law enforcement agencies. Then there is something called as double standard and it is closely related to the uh, Python. So let's see how it relates to Python. So in United States federal law, the double standard is the rule of evidence regarding the admissibility of expert witness testimony. So a party may raise a double motion, a special motion in limen raised before or during trial to exclude the presentation of unqualified evidence to the jury. So there are some illustrative factors. So the court defined the scientific methodology as the process of uh, formulating hypothesis and then conducting experiments to prove or falsify the hypothesis and provided a set of illustrative factors. So these illustrative factors are, has the technique been tested in actual field conditions and not just in laboratory. Then next is, has the technique been subject to peer review and publication? What is the known or potential rate of error? Do standards exist for the control of the technique's operation? Has the technique been generally accepted within the relevant scientific community? Now in 2003, Brian Carrier published a paper that examined the rules of evidence standards, including Daubert, and compared and contrasted the open source and closed source forensic tools. So one of his key conclusions was that using the guidelines of Daubert tests, we have shown that the open source tools may more clearly and comprehensively meet the guideline requirements than would closed source uh, tools. So this is an important statement. Since Python is open source, it complies to Daubert standards. So the results are not automatic, of course, so just because the source is open. So rather specific steps must be followed regarding the design, development, and validation. So can the program or algorithm be explained? This explanation should be explained in words, not only in terms of code. Has enough information been provided such that thorough tests can be developed to test the program? Have error rates been calculated and validated independently? Has the program been studied and peer reviewed? Has the program been generally accepted by the community? So these are the most common steps, common steps which happen in the development and maintenance of any open source software. Since Python is open source, so these steps are already taken care. The next is setting up Python for forensic application development. There are many uh, factors which you need to consider here. So first one is your background and organization support. So what is your uh, programming background? Whether your organization supports the development 
of open source software whether they recognize the contribution to open source software then choosing the third party libraries so oh, this is again a very very important so large number of third party libraries are available in case of python then ide is and their features so again we have got very good ides which are uh, very intelligent and they save a lot of time when we are typing or when we are developing a new software the next is installation so whether you want to install the operating system on a standalone machine or you want to use a virtual machine or you want to go for a cloud uh, setup the next is right version of python so this is also very very important so using right version of python is very very important because you may use a third party library it has to be compatible with the uh, present version of python or it may affect the version of python so choosing right version of python for the third party library becomes very very important the next is graphical versus shell so if you are a beginner then you may prefer a graphical user interface and if you are a geek then you may go for shell because with a uh, commands you can achieve more things and when you go for a shell there is generally a uh, lot of flexibility and while using the command and you can actually achieve more things compared to graphical user interface then built in functions and modules python has got large number of modules and those can be used to develop uh, forensic uh, software okay let's see some examples so for example hash okay you can use this function to compute the hash right then similarly some random function sorted functions so these can be used to develop a small forensic application now this is a small program which you can consider so here we are trying to generate the ip addresses of course these are all local ip addresses loopback addresses so here we are generating 10 uh, uh, ip addresses that's what we have specified in the range function then you can also see here that we are using append function and str function which basically helps us to generate 10 ip addresses then next is uh, we are using the uh, OS module, importing the OS module and using the get cwd uh, function. So that is nothing but the get the current working directory and list all the four files and uh, folders in the current working directory. The next is the forensic indexing and uh, searching. Actually, you can use the simple file search and index function. So in this code, you can see here there is a set which is defined. So that is nothing but the search words. then we have specified the uh, keywords in the keywords.txt file then opening the uh, keywords.txt file and searching then we are adding all the uh, words from keywords.txt file to search words uh, uh, set then we are checking whether the python word is uh, present then we are checking whether the python word is present in search words uh, set so if it is present then we are uh, printing word is found else we are say saying that it is not found so this is a very simple example but it can help us to find out the relevant uh, terms related to the evidence now if you want to build a much more advanced search engine then you can go for uh, hush so hush is used basically for forensic indexing and searching basically you can build google x search engine for your uh, data so it was created and is maintained by matt and it was originally created for the use in online help system for side effects so it's a pythonic api and it's a pure python library and it supports uh, fast indexing and retrieval it also supports filtered indexing and uh, search and the advantage is that it has a powerful query language now in this code you can see here that first we are importing the required modules such as uh, create in and we are uh, also importing the required modules from fields <laughs> then we are defining a, a schema in schema we are defining the title path and the content then we are creating the uh, schema then we are adding all the documents so we are adding the document title and the document 
path and also the document content. So this helps us to build the uh, database. Then writer.commit will save the data into the database here, then use the QParser module. So basically here we are uh, going to search for required keywords. The next is hash functions for forensics. So as I have told, hash function is used to check the integrity of the data. So you can see here that we are going to import the hashlib library. Then we are using SHA-256 uh, method. Then we are defining the message. So this message is defined in two parts. So in first part, we have defined Python is A. And in second part, we have defined a we are defined it as a great programming language, right? Then we are computing the digest over the message and printing the digest. Then next, we are defining one more message called as X. And again, we are computing the SHA-256 uh, uh, machine algorithm we are using. Then we are using again the uh, digest method to compute the digest. Now we are checking the digest of X message with the digest of M message. Now you can see here that since they are same, it is displaying the message as true. Now in the second case, what I have done is I have slightly added, slightly modified the second message X that is added the extra space after dot. So in this case, when I compare the message digest of both X and M messages, it is displaying false. That means the integrity has been compromised. The next is uh, forensic evidence extraction. So here, um, we can use a pillow. So it's a Python imaging uh, library. So it provides extensive file format support and it's again a core image library and many wrappers are available for pillow. Now we can see here that you can use, uh, uh, you, you can, first you can import uh, uh, tags if you want to extract the information about uh, uh, files, uh, especially the uh, images. Now you can also in extract the GPS tags, so which includes uh, latitude and longitude uh, uh, information. So similarly, if you want, you can extract uh, uh, both the kinds of information that is normal file properties and uh, GPS properties associated with a with an image. The next. You can go for a pie screenshot module, which will help you to take the screenshot programmatically. So it tries to allow to take screenshots without installing third-party libraries. It is cross-platform, but mainly useful for Linux-based distributions. So in this code, you can see here that you can take the screenshot of entire, entire screen. So import the uh, pie screenshot module as image grab, then use the grab method then use the save method and specify the file name. Now, if you want to take the screenshot of a particular portion of a screen, that is part of screen, you don't want the screenshot of entire screen. So in this case, you need to specify the uh, coordinates. That is x1, y1 and x2, y2. That is starting point and the ending point. So here we have specified that using bbox um, uh, property and we have specified the x1, y1 and x2, y2 coordinates. So it will take the uh, image specified in these coordinates. Now, if you are worried about the performance, then you can also check the performance here. So this, whatever time you are noting down here, it is the time taken to take 10 screenshots with different uh, imaging libraries. But in forensics performance does not matter extracting the evidence is very, very important. So you may ignore this part, but if you're still interested, then you can do some modifications. That is setting the child process as, uh, as zero. Then also you can modify the background such as Scrot and MSS and also make child process as false. So this will help you to uh, deal with the performance. That is improve the performance. Then metadata forensics. So Mutagen is a Python module to handle uh, audio metadata. So it supports various uh, file formats such as ASF, FLAC, MP4, and so on. It, and also the MP3, org, verbis, and so on. 
So Mutagen works with the Python 3.6 version. Okay. Now this is how you can uh, work with uh, Mutagen. So the file function takes any uh, audio file as the input and try to guess its type and return the file type instance. So here you can see here that when we use bprint method, it's actually displaying the properties of audio file, such as of verbis, then the duration and the bits per second. So similarly, you can also get the properties of a flag file and you can also get the information with respect to mp3 file. Then if you want to extract the information from PDF file, then you can use the pipe PDF2 library. It's a pure Python library built as a PDF toolkit, and it is capable of extracting document information such as title, author, then splitting documents page by page, merging documents page by page, cropping pages, then merging multiple pages into single page, then encrypting and decrypting PDF files. So it's a very useful tool for websites that manage or manipulate uh, PDFs. The next is the PE file. So PE file stands for portable executable file. It's a multi-platform Python module to parse and work with portable executable files. So portable executable files are Windows operating system files. So most of the information contained in the PE file is the headers and it is accessible as well as all the sections of data and metadata are accessible. So the structures defined in the Windows header files will be accessible as attributes in the PE instance. So PE file requires some basic understanding of the layout of the PE file. With it, it is possible to explore nearly every single feature of the PE file format. Now, some of the tasks which are possible with the PE file are inspecting headers, analyzing sections data, retrieving embedded data, then reading strings from the resources, then warning for suspicious and malformed values, then basic butchering of uh, portable executables such as writing to some fields and other parts of the PE. This functionality won't rearrange PE file structure to make room for new fields. So use it with care. So overwriting fields should be mostly be safe. Then packer detection with PE ID signatures, then PE ID signature generation. The next is using natural language tools. Now note here that using natural language processing tools is very, very important because we have got huge number of, uh, we have got huge amount of information. So whatever information we capture, it will be in terms of uh, gigabytes, sometimes even terabytes. So here you need to use the uh, tools and technologies such as natural language processing and machine learning and artificial intelligence which will examine the text for the evidence and using NLP concepts. So basically, if you apply NLP concepts, they will help you to identify the correlation between different pieces of evidence. So if you are working with uh, natural languages, uh, especially the English, then the better choices are NLTK, SPACE-C, and Textacy. So of course, NLTK also supports more than one language, more than one human language. It also supports languages such as Spanish and other uh, things. But uh, the major support is available for English. Then similarly, SPACE is industry standard uh, tool for natural language processing. And Textacy is built on top of SPACE, which offers additional features. Then there are two libraries, that is Tanza and Polyglot, which are basically multilingual uh, natural language processing uh, packages. So Stanza supports around 66 human languages, whereas Polyglot is uh, Polyglot has huge support for many number of languages. Say so it supports around 200 languages, but not all features are supported for those 200 languages. Then, if you are particularly interested in uh, uh, Indian uh, languages, such as uh, Hindi or in either language of India, then you can go for INLTK and Indic NLP. Of course, you can also do it with NLTK and also you can check Stanza and Polyglot for that. So in summary, it is very important to follow the standard procedure 
led by the law enforcement agencies during investigation process. Otherwise, it will not be accepted in the court of law. Evidence will not be accepted. Then there are many open source as well as commercial tools for digital forensics. So learning to develop your own tool is always advantageous and using open source tool will uh, save a lot of money. Then many tools written in Python are pure Python implementations and most uh, importantly, Python and open source tools comply with Dauber standard, which is very, very important. So thank you everyone for attending my talk. So Katenda, we didn't see um, some people much here, but I will like just uh, keep like asking you about like your talk, right? Okay. So um, so uh, when in inside your talk, right, you're talking about the process of the the investigation. They have like mm -hmm. correction, identification, a lot of things, and mm -hmm. which one do you think is like most critical or like um is like we need to be careful about it. Uh, I think when we speak of law, all the steps are uh, really critical. Okay. But um, mm -hmm. I feel that uh, data collection is very critical. You need to identify the objects wherever you feel that the evidence may might be present. So those needs to be collected mm -hmm. first. Ah, so you need to ensure that licensing... you need to yeah, you need to ensure that um, nothing is left out. And it is uh -huh. really difficult when you are collecting the evidence from volatile memory. Mm, so there are methods. Do you have like some like technique or like something that want to recommend all the audience about like how to correct data? Yeah, so basically uh, if you consider um, laptop or a hard disk you can take the system image so when i say system image you are copying the data from hard disk to hard disk so there are some softwares like norton ghost you can take help of uh, those softwares mm. and uh, to collect the data from say for example sometimes it is very important to perform live forensics uh, because turning off the system or turning on the system will change the state of the system and it will alter the evidence. So in that case, you if you don't have uh, any tools at that moment, then you can simply just pull the plug and take the system into the lab and um, collect the data. Mm, thank you so much. So we have some of our uh, audience here. So if you have any question, you just raise your hand. We are now with Gajendra uh, Deshpande from India. He gave a talk about a cyber forensics. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, okay? We're just talking about the process of the investigation and Gajenda just tell us about like the correction is very important. So um, so Gajenda, there is a lot of like, um, uh, another thing like, uh, for example, the, the process of examination, right? So in your talk, you mentioned like, like uh, is, you need to like do something from the not original copy but you have to like maybe simulate some like another copy and then you just need to, can you explain more about that one? Yeah, because what happens is if you start working on the original data, then your tools may edit the evidence. So that should not happen. And uh, you know that some people may challenge the evidence or the investigation process. So in that case, um, higher investigation team will come and they may have to work on the same data. So it is not recommended to work on the original data. So always work on the copy of data. Even if it corrupts, then no issues. You always have a copy. And after that, you also need to ensure that the original copy and the original data both are same. So that you can do using, that you can check using hashing algorithms. Ah, so just use hashing algorithm to like compare two of them? Yeah. That, yeah, you oh, need to compute okay. the message digest and ensure that data is not altered. Copy is not altered. Copy and the original uh, evidence both are same. Mm -hmm. So, like you, you have you have mentioned that a, a lot of like kind of Python tools or library that can use like 
for example, like extract image or like GPS thing. Can you have give example uh, about real case that use the py Python to um to solve the problem about cyber forensics? Yeah, basically we want to ensure that the photo has been taken at the right location. So you can extract the properties of a file using the Python uh, uh, language. And there are uh, uh, tags which we have discussed, except tags which will actually get you the file properties and GPS tags will give you the location information. So in that way, you can ensure that the evidence has been carried, uh, investigation has been carried out at the right place. Even say, for example, you can also check, uh, say, for example, there, is, there was a crime happening and somebody was taking a photograph of it. And you can confirm really whether the crime has really happened at that location by checking the GPS tags. Mm, thank you so much. For those who are um, watching us, if you would like to ask some questions, just raise your hand and then we will open your microphone and so that you can ask our speaker. Okay. okay um, oh, while we are waiting for questions, so I just ask another question then. So since you are very expert in about cybersecurity, what do you see in like the future about of cyber uh, security and cyber forensics? And also like, um, you are a professor, right? You taught some like <laughs> this kind of topic. <laughs> so yeah. just uh, tell like why people need to study about it also. Okay. So regarding the first question, the future of cybersecurity, we know that uh, artificial intelligence is uh, actually disrupting the information technology in many application uh, areas. So we see AI coming into cybersecurity, AI coming into cyber forensics, and also a lot of uh, automation will happen uh, with respect to cybersecurity. So that's the future, I can say. Say, for example, we have technologies now, robotic process automation, Right, where we try to automate many things, so even security will come into picture. And then uh, uh, you are regarding your second question, why you need to study cyber security? It's a universal uh, thing. You take any technology, security issues will be there. So right from legacy technology to the mo most modern technology. So security issues will be there. And as the new technology comes, obviously there will be new, new threats and maybe the existing threats may also be there in the new technology. So for every field, it's there. So we just need to change our um, uh, thinking. So we need to become security focused people. Say if we are developing a software, then we need to develop software with security focus. If we are developing a website, then we need to develop the website with security focus. If we are automating the things, then we need to uh, develop the automation flow with security focus. Yes. How about like our future generation? <laughs> so like um like we have to like more like focus right like security focus and how about the like the young generation that like grow up in the like uh in the like fast technology in this time want to say something to, uh, to them? <laughs> That's uh, very difficult to uh, say something. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you consider the present market scenario, then at least um, next 10 years, there's a lot of scope for uh, cyber security. So those who want to make careers there, then you can go for um, cyber security. But if you are asking for the future of uh, a generation, then uh, there's a person uh, uh, you might be aware of his name, Yuval Noah Harari. So he has written books on the history of uh, mankind. So one of his in one of his talks, he was mentioning that if you are learning for learning any skill, then that will be valid for only 10 years. So every 10 years, you need to learn a new skill. So that may be the future for the next generation. Okay. Uh, let's see that we have some question or not. I, I do um, have questions though. Oh, yes. Yeah. Go ahead, please. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I just want to ask, like, what, what is your thought? Uh, towards cyber security and privacy. Cyber security and privacy. 
privacy yeah yeah so security and privacy uh, they are you can say two faces of the same coin right so uh, during pandemic uh, you might have seen that many governments have uh, tried to develop an app and maybe they wanted uh, their citizens to enroll uh, in those apps for example in india we had arogya setu app right so we don't know how our data will be used but when we speak of privacy there are technologies which are uh, coming up say for example homomorphic encryption or confidential computing we can also call it so where you can perform computations on the encrypted data so i think if we employ those technologies it's possible to take care of uh, privacy but it will take time to evolve those technologies how well how, how well it is being like taken care of as of like now that like, you know uh as of now i think uh, it it is been taken care but not that much uh, we have again encryption and decryption but the moment you decrypt the data it becomes vulnerable so for that only uh, there's a technology called homomorphic encryption it is still in its um, uh, you can say nascent stage so it still needs to evolve that's is good thank you so much So like yes. you can use like cyber security technique to like to protect our privacy also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and oh, like since this uh conference is about Python, right? So, um, you mentioned like in your talk like about to accept by the law, you have to have like Dobert standards, right? Yeah. And yeah. how you said like the Python is comply and will accept by the law. Yeah, actually, Dobber standard is used in the US, but you can consider it as a test. So, if you have seen my talk, then I have mentioned few questions. So, forensic science, forensic is called as science. So, when we say science, then there are some steps. So, we just can't say anything as a science. So, there needs to be experiment. There needs to be a proper tool. and that proper tool should be accepted by the scientific uh, community and there has to be a methodology right so when we say scientific experiment uh, there will be some steps there will be some objectives there will be some results right so when anybody repeats those steps they should get the same results so then only we can say that it's a scientific experiment then it's a science right so for that there are some uh, questions which needs to be asked so they are mentioned in the dobert standard and when we speak of open source open source technology complies to dobber standard because code is open and you can explain code in uh, even using a normal english language and there's a community right so it's not that whatever I, I, code i have written it's final so there will be community members who will review our code right so all these things comply to dobber standard and since python is open source it also complies to dobber standard So that's why it is accepted. So, like for those who know Python and then know how to write application to like maybe investigate the evidence, the for our cyber forensics, uh, can like can like comply to the standard of law, right? Hmm. So, like, do you have like any recommend for those who want to apply Python to do some like program or application about cyber forensic? What should they start or any reference book or anything that you can recommend them uh, okay so actually speaking you consider cyber security or cyber forensics they are actually tool based so you don't need really the programming knowledge but if you have programming mm-hmm. knowledge then you you have the edge you have the advantage so if there's a need and if your tool don't support that uh, feature then you can write the code quickly and uh, get the task done or you can also use the small scripts to automate the things which can save your time so those are the stuffs you can do actually mm-hmm. just to remind that there's two more minutes that one more minutes left for this session okay so you have one more minute if anyone want to ask question or maybe like after this you can is it okay gajendra if someone like just contact and chat with you directly yeah, sure sure yeah. not a problem Okay, and uh, it's almost the end of our session. Do you have any like um, anything want to say with everyone? 
I just want to appreciate the work done by PyCon APAC team. So you guys are doing very wonderful work. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be your MC today also and our and Ivy, our moderator, join us today and all of those who are joining us today. So I hope all of you enjoy the conference and now we, are, we will close this Q&A session. If you have more questions, just directly, uh, just ping um, Gajendra uh, if he available. Okay, thank you so much everyone. See you for the next session. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Ivy. Bye.